March 22nd, 1999. Over the years, 2020 has brought you the stories of some remarkably courageous people. But tonight we're going to introduce you to a man whose courage is truly unparalleled. He went through an ordeal so horrible any one of us might have just given up. But he has survived and he has thrived. Dax Cowart is his name and Bob Brown has his story. Here it comes, Dax. All right, the sun. When he sails in the Gulf of Mexico, he sees through the eyes of friends. Right now it's still orange. It's hitting the back of the cloud. Yeah. So what you see, you see the silhouette of the sunlight along the shape of the top of that cumulus cloud. Ah. Uh -huh. Dax Cowart is a Texas lawyer who was blinded after a fire that disfigured and nearly destroyed his face and body 25 years ago. In his circle of friends, for reasons that are different for every person who comes face to face with him, meetings and conversations with Dax are memorable occurrences. You know, when you first see Dax, it's impossible not to notice him. Bob Hilliard is the senior partner in the Corpus Christi law firm where Dax works. The first time I was around him, we were at breakfast, and I, um, I told him that he had the most beautiful blue eyes. They reminded me of my daughter Emily's eyes. Uh, and I didn't know at the time that he was blind. And he smiled real big. And I said, uh, they're plastic, Bob. <laughs> and uh, we got to be friends right off the bat for the first time. From first impressions onward, Cowart manages to set at ease people who were not always sure how to respond to him. Two professions, medicine and law, have studied and learned from him and debated about his life because much of the story of his recovery from fire is as impossible to conceive as it is to forget. In Texas, where he grew up, Howard was a high school athlete whose favorite sport was football and who also rode broncos and bulls and rodeos. He joined the Air Force in 1970 on his birthday, December 16th, and learned to fly jet airplanes. He was handsome and charismatic, and following his active duty, he intended to pursue a career as a commercial pilot. While he waited for more training, he went to work temporarily for his father Ray in an East Texas real estate office. That business took them both to this stretch of land near a creek bed outside of Henderson, Texas on July 25, 1973 to inspect a piece of property for sale. What they couldn't see was that beneath the land ran a pipe from an oil refinery a corroded pipe that was leaking propane gas, which is odorless and invisible. When Cowart and his father returned to their car, the ignition refused to work. So Cowart's father opened the hood and Cowart sat behind the wheel trying to get the car to start. When it finally did start, the propane in the air ignited. Cowart ran from the car through three walls of fire, burning and shouting for help. And when he collapsed onto a dirt road and was struck by unimaginable pain, he had one request to the passerby who found him. I asked him to bring me a gun. And uh, he said, why? And I said, yeah, I'm a dead man. Can't you see I'm a dead man? I'm going to die anyway. I've got to put myself out of this misery. And um, in a very kind and caring way, he said, I can't do that. Cowart and his father eventually were taken here to Parkland Hospital in Dallas. Ray Cowart died on the way to Parkland. Dax was admitted to the burn unit in pain so excruciating that he would plead with his doctors to let him die by ending treatments that were torturous, such as immersing him in a vat of Clorox and water to fight infection. So it really wasn't that I, I didn't want to live. It was just that I, I did not want to live in the pain and in the physical condition that I would have to live in. He was totally, totally helpless, totally dependent, couldn't move himself at all, and that must have been terrifying. I have no idea what it would be like to experience that kind of pain, but I can see why he wanted to end it. Dr. Bill Winslade, the Institute for the Medical Humanities at the University of Texas Medical Branch in Galveston, says Cowart's appeals to refuse treatment videotaped during this interview with psychiatrist Robert White in May of 1974, awakened people in law and medicine to a new issue. And this video was shown all over the country in medical schools and law schools because we were all struggling with what do you do with a patient who doesn't want 
to get the treatment that the doctors are recommending. Dax's mother, Ada, sided with doctors. She told the makers of a documentary called Dax's Case that she had additional concerns, that he not die without accepting the teachings of her church. I was hoping he would have time to realize his responsibility to God and come to a realization of what he should be doing. In the end, Cowart did win one of the first victories of its kind in this country. He was declared competent to refuse treatment. But then he could find no one at the time to represent him in court. And at that point, I just told myself, uh, since I'm going to live anyway, I might as well give it my best shot. Come here. Cowart returned to his home in Henderson 14 months after his hospitalization. I told my mother all I'll be able to do is sit on the corner and sell pencils. I wanted to be productive. I wanted to feel self-worth. And um, I wanted that security. He began a long process of building a new life that was fraught with sleeplessness and depression and a suicide attempt in which police found him listening for the sound of a truck he planned to leap in front of. He received more medical treatment for sleepless nights and nightmares. Treatment he believes was key to the process of surviving and of finding a role to play in life. He struggled through a 10-year period in which he entered law school, studied by having books read to him or listening to recordings, and emerged with a law degree from Texas Tech University in 1986. The man who had fought for the right to die turned out to have an extraordinary will to succeed. He became a powerful and well-known advocate of patients' rights, but he closed a small law practice in Henderson after failing to get the kinds of cases he wanted. And it wasn't until he came here to the badlands of Wyoming that he finally found his calling in law. A friend convinced him to apply to a trial lawyer's college on a ranch owned by the famed attorney Jerry Spence. Here was this severely injured man, in some ways a frightening looking person, and yet it wasn't hard for me to understand that this was a special person. He's able to relate to human beings in a very sensitive way that most people can't, and most lawyers can't. Another lawyer who was attending the college, Bob Hilliard, a partner in a firm in Corpus Christi, Texas, was impressed enough to offer Dax a full-time job. I said, I'd like you to come down to Corpus and uh, take a look at my firm and see if you'd like to work there. And he was a lot more cautious than I was, a uh, uh, lot more hesitant. And I learned later, I think it was his fear of whether he could do it. One recurring dream that I used to have a lot is I would be sitting on the bench uh, on the sidelines of the football field during the last game of my senior year. And in the dream, I had never gotten on the field to play a single down. And it was the fourth quarter, late in the fourth quarter, and I could see the clock ticking down. Did it represent something to you? I felt my life was slipping away. And um, I was getting older. I had not established a career. I was frustrated that my life was ending without my really having gotten onto the playing field of life. Good morning, Hilary Munoz. Dax accepted the job from Hilliard in a move that placed him squarely on the playing field and gave him the opportunity to fight for people he understood better than anyone else, clients who had suffered devastating personal injuries. Only a few months short of the 25th anniversary of the explosion in Texas, Dax was assigned as lead attorney on a case involving a Mexican woman named Roberta, injured on the first day of work of her first job. Dax mastered the details and depositions by having them transcribed onto audio tapes that he listened to again and again. Convinced there was no way his client could have known on her first day that the attic flooring the contractor had installed was not safe to stand on. But Dax had much more to learn in the courthouse in San Diego, Texas, where he would stand before a jury. We returned there with him and his young co-counsel, John Flood, and they demonstrated how Flood taught Dax to orient himself to the courtroom he couldn't see. Get the judge right there. Using a three-edged ruler, Flood pointed to where the jury, witnesses, and judge would be in relation to their table. 
He walked with Dax to the place Dax would stand to address the jury. When the trial started, you know, he kept worrying about the evidence. And I said, Dax, I assure you, you know this evidence better than anybody in this entire courtroom. But it was also crucial to Dax to communicate the questions of justice that had been so much a part of his life. If the doctors cannot do anything to help Roberta walk again, to make her put her life back like it was before, she became paralyzed, then a money award is all that's left. That's all this country says that we can do to give a plaintiff justice. If you're traveling to the North Country Fair, in what became the most extraordinary and in some ways unsettling and risky moment of his closing argument, he began to sing to the jury from a Bob Dylan song, Girl from the North Country, a verse, he said, about people caring for one another. Remember me. I was watching one woman on the front row, and for about the first four words, her arms were crossed, and she slouched. And she was very uncomfortable with this. But after about two lines, you know, she uncrossed her arms and her face relaxed uh, and she tilted her head and by the time he was done, you know, they knew each other. Please see she has a coat so warm to keep her from the howling wind. The multi-million dollar verdict he won in this first case he tried for Hilliard and Munoz surprised no one who knew him. For 25 years, one way or another, Dax has fought a host of battles, the private ones tougher than the public ones. He now lives in a house by the Gulf of Mexico with a caregiver who helps him start the day and get to work. It is impossible not to think of how much would have been lost and undone if he had been allowed to die as he wished. But one other thing that characterizes Dax is that he will not back down from his position that he should have been the one with the final decision, not his doctors. Do you believe the doctors made the right decision to treat you knowing now what you've been able to do, the person you've been able to become? No, they made the wrong decision. Uh, the only difference is now I feel even more strongly about it. Uh, no human being has the right to force another human being to undergo that kind of pain and to take away that person's right to self-determination. I think their heart was pure, but they were wrong. And um, I, I hold no bitterness towards them, uh, no anger towards them. You know, if Dax had his wish granted, then uh, you know, my life would be a lot different. What he gives me, and I think other people in the firm, is and what he teaches us is how to see, how to see each other. You know, it's a gift that has touched people all over the country just because he, he's alive.